I'm really excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, one of the things that I want to do, I'll, I'll start with a little bit of a story about how I came to the point of, of feeling like I had something to say about procrastination. I've done a lot of work around it. Um, but before I do that, I want to mention that we'll be using a tool called Mentimeter, which is like an online quizzing software. And we won't use it in a quizzing format, like a right and wrong answer, but in a contributing part of your journey. But the, the way I came about uh, tackling procrastination is I felt like I was a pretty smart, real hard worker. I should be kind of getting things done. And I ended up in a couple of marketing jobs where I was the solo marketer. So all of my inbound digital marketing is all as a team of one. I, I really work a lot with solopreneurs um, or real small businesses because I've been a marketing team of one with a budget of your salary. So uh, I'm working in these positions and I do my research and I'm tracking my metrics and I'm just not doing what I should be doing, what I know is important to do. My metrics don't look great, but I'm working with people who don't know anything about marketing and they think I'm doing a fantastic job. And I'm like, don't Google articles about marketing metrics, please. Like I just was not executing. I wasn't doing the work the way I wanted to. And I felt like I had a lot of potential and just was not meeting it time and time again. So I was playing in this Akimbo community. It's a Seth Godin alumni community that no longer exists, but it was packed full of people who are innovators and early adopters. And so we were running, a, a colleague of mine and I were running all these experiments on accountability groups and productivity groups and different kinds of ways of, of, of trying to get this work out of me because I was doing it for myself, really. But we brought all these people on board and had masterminds and, and all of these different um, experiments that we did. So I've experimented a great deal around this. But um, at some point, even with all this help, like I just was not quite getting where I wanted to go. So I took one of these sessions and went, I, you mentioned I had a, a background in mental health. So I just went, I took that tack and said, self-observation, self-awareness, what's going on? And I learned two things. Number one, which is a talk for another day, but it's vitally important. I really needed to do less so that I could do it better. So we're all probably totally overcommitted. If anybody's used the word busy in the past day, this is a problem that you have. Most of us have this problem. So I had to tackle that, which was one of the steps. The other one that we will talk about today is that there was nothing wrong with me. I had this really negative self-talk about how I must be lazy or how maybe I didn't really want these goals or I didn't really care about it or something like that. It was just a terrible monster in my head. But what I learned was that the expectations, the world just expects for something to be out there and for you to grab it. And that's not how everyone works. Some people work that way and they just make a list and they do everything on the list. There are a lot of us who don't work that way. And it's not that there's anything wrong with us. It's that we just need to change our tactics. So you are fine. Change your tactics. Don't use the tactics that work for somebody else. Figure out which ones work for you. And that's what we'll talk about today. So for our Mentimeter presentation, or for the quizzing, we'll get on here. Let's go to our first question. And I'd love to um, hear from you all uh, what task I'd like you to Think about a task you've been procrastinating and use it as your thought experiment through this presentation. I'll put information out there and you can apply it to this task you're procrastinating. So I'd love to hear some of the things that, um, that you're thinking about. And I believe you can enter more than once. If there's more than one thing you're procrastinating, feel free to pop it in there. And then um, we'll see them pop up on the screen. It is anonymous. So you don't have to worry about folks knowing anything. If, uh, if you prefer to keep it anonymous, it is. And I see a comment from uh, Hannah in there about ADHD, um, letting you make and follow lists. I'll try to incorporate some tips for um, folks with ADHD. I've worked with folks with ADHD back in my mental health days. And then a lot of folks in my Go Go Den community struggle with that. And I'll, I'll, so I'll try to sprinkle in some gems there. So tasks being procrastinating, a sport, writing an important blog post, excellent, reading books to learn, excellent, several 3D printing projects, nice. Answering direct messages that sometimes those stack up to starting hard, complicated tasks. Ooh, we're going to talk about that one. That's a good one. Cleaning. I'll talk about that a little bit too. work and reading. Those are really big categories. That's a lot of procrastinating. Uh, let's see. And then why isn't it scrolling? Oh, it's entered. Scroll. Come here. Hold on. I don't know why I'm not scrolling. Pause. Scroll. Shortcut. Enter. Should be. I can't catch this last one. Anyway. Thank you for contributing to these 
uh, list of, here it goes, there it goes, it, reading unpleasant emails, heck yes, that's definitely something I procrastinate as well. I do inbox zero probably at least once a week, but boy, it, it doesn't happen every day. All right, so let's dig in a little bit to procrastination. Okay, we did our Mentimeter question. So let's talk about um, what's going on inside our heads. So in order to understand procrastination, we want to understand what's actually happening inside our brains. And uh, there's a psychologist named Jonathan Haidt, and he proposed a metaphor. And for, I'm assuming this is a pretty well-read group. If any of you have read the book Switch by Chip and Dan Heath, they use John Haidt's metaphor in there. And the idea is that, um, that our that what we do and the decisions that we make, um, it's like you have a giant elephant and a tiny rider, right? And, and that rider is on top of the elephant trying to steer the elephant. And if the elephant wants to make a turn, the rider can try to pull the elephant the other way. But as we see here, that's probably not going to work. It's probably not going to work. And what these represent is the elephant represents our old brain. So our hind brain that, was, that evolved first. And it really is this supercomputer. It can manage so many more pieces of data than the rider, our prefrontal cortex, our new brain. It can manage so much more information and it's where decision-making happens. So it's this big supercomputer, but because we've developed conscious thought, we think we're our conscious brain, but we're really this combination of this conscious brain and the subconscious brain. And in between the two of those, how they communicate, how the, um, the elephant communicates with the rider is through emotion. So this is what's happening in there. And this is, we'll learn a little bit more about um, what the elephant wants and what the rider wants. But what I want folks to understand right away is that if your conscious mind is the rider and your subconscious mind is the elephant, willpower lives in the conscious mind with the rider. And we look and see how outmatched this rider is. So Willpower tools are fantastic and they will grow your willpower and improve your willpower, but they will never make a writer as big as an elephant. And so willpower is a tool in your toolbox, not the answer. So oftentimes people think I hear try harder all the time and it makes me cringe. No more trying harder. You need to try different tactics. It's not a fair fight. So let's learn a little bit more about this elephant and this writer. So when it comes to motivation, the elephant is all about survival. So, so we think about this is the part of the brain that developed earliest. So the reason we are alive is because our elephant has done such a great job of keeping us alive. So the elephant is focused on air and food and water, those basic needs, on belonging because we developed in tribal communities. We evolved in tribal communities and we evolved to survive as groups. So if you get kicked out of the group, you oftentimes died. So this is where um, feelings like shame or not belonging are incredibly painful for us. And we will be incredibly avoidant of them. Uh, the elephant also is interested in procreation, passing your genes along, has a very short term bias. Survival is about right now and it's about making it into the next moment. And this is for any of you who have been watching your health. And then somebody puts a cookie in front of you and you're like, it's so important for me to be watching my health. And yet this cookie is in my, my mouth. What happened? Elephant short-term wants food, wants sugars and fats in particular, right? Not a fair fight right there. And then the elephant uh, communicates through emotions, right? It's going to push those emotions into your, your awareness, hopefully into your awareness. Sometimes we operate with them a little bit subconsciously, especially with procrastination. What does the writer, what motivates the writer? The writer is more interested in things like attractiveness and status and relationships. These are all about being in the tribe, but excelling in the tribe. So the elephant wants to just make sure that you pass your genes on and you're alive. But the writer will look for, I want to have the best mate and I want to be the most important one in this tribe, right? So we'll go after these longer term things that take some investment, this long term bias of thriving. And we have our thoughts. This is how the writer expresses itself is through these thoughts and then, and then through language and, and so on. So if you're alive now, it means what you've done in the past hasn't killed you. And this supercomputer of a, an elephant, right? It likes a predictive model. If it worked in the past, it's going to work in the future and we're not going to die. We like this, right? Uh, if it's brand new, it has no predictive model for it and it will start to push negative emotions to the writer to say, I don't have a predictive model for this. We could die. Don't like it. Don't do it. Right. This is where, where we start to see how those negative emotions churn up. 
Um, the elephant also evolved to be an energy miser. It does not want to spend energy because you never know when a saber toothed tiger pops out and you got to have extra energy to run away. So it likes the path of least resistance. So there's one element in this picture we haven't talked about, which is the path, the path that they're standing on. So the path represents the environment in which we are in. So all things being equal, the elephant will just walk down the path you put in front of it if it's the path of least resistance. So we're going to talk a little bit about the path uh, during this presentation about you know, we know that willpower for the rider is a very limited resource, but the rider can craft a path or point the elephant with a little bit of willpower down a path and let that elephant just go take that path of least resistance. So this is our metaphor for engineering an environment in which success is like, is like the only, maybe not the only route we can always fail, but, and failing is okay, but it's the most likely route for that elephant to take. So we'll talk a little bit about, uh, about the path as well. Uh, I think I pretty much already covered this. So that elephant is learning by repeated experience and observation. That's that predictive model. This We've done this 10 times. This has been the outcome every time. I'm comfortable with this. We're going to do this from now on. And it wires that path into your brain. And our writer can learn by integrating brand new information. It can uh, change its mind by using imagination or creativity, right? You can change your mind in a flash immediately with a new idea. The elephant does not change that quickly. The elephant needs repeated experience. So we get so frustrated because we get a new piece of information that, you know, cookies are bad for you. Sugar is bad for you. And we're like, no more sugar. And the elephant's like, we're eating sugar every day. So the elephant needs to have a different experience and a different set of experiences and develop a different predictive model in order to push for a different behavior. Otherwise, it's going to keep doing what it's always done. So anyone who's tried to change a habit, it's really nice way to see where giving up that old habit is really hard until you establish a new one and substituting a new one is easier. And then when you fall off that wagon, when you fall back into that old habit, it's so easy because that pathway is already a well-worn pathway is already there. So we can change our minds. We can change our, our writer can change its mind immediately. The elephant needs time and repetition in order to change the behaviors that it's choosing. So when we experience this negative emotion, it's actually not, um, it's procrastination itself and the negative emotions that come up are not actually a vice. It's not actually a bad thing. It's just a notification system. It's just the elephant saying, I'm uncomfortable. You're wanting me to do something that I can't predict the outcome. I'm going to make you feel dread, fear, anxiety, whatever your particular brands of emotions around procrastination are, elephant's going to push that there. And it's our job to, to see that as what it is, which is a notification. Uh, and then respond accordingly. So writer is, we know the writer is outmatched. It needs to work in harmony with the elephant and the path. So what does that look like? So what we want our writer to do instead of bullying the elephant, which will only, which is not helpful. We want that writer to smooth the path and soothe the elephant. So let's talk about uh, smoothing the path first. So the path is again, our environment. What, what kind of environment we're in will the, that elephant will want to take that path of least resistance. So we want to craft a path of least resi resistance that matches our goal, the procrastinated task we want to do or the habit we want to build. So we want to create an intentional environment. We want to engineer our environment to create that path of least resistance. That's the one that is the one we want that elephant to take, that the writer wants that elephant to take. So uh, let's look at it's a busy slide. We'll take it. We'll take it one square at a time. This is like a menu of options for how to manipulate your environment in a way to create a path of least resistance that you want for your elephant. So in the upper left, we have don't go it alone. Don't be, don't do it alone. We evolved in groups. And so we want to think about how other people factor in to how we do things because we very, as we evolved, we were very rarely doing anything alone. Uh, so something like an accountability buddy, a coach, a mentor, a role model that you want to be just like, maybe you enroll in a course, maybe you get your family behind you. You're trying to hit 10,000 steps a day, get your kids on board with that. And I have them asking you how many steps you're at and taking extra steps with you, that kind of thing in the red box, changing your physical environment, tidying up. What is it? Marie Kondo has the, isn't it called the magic of tidying up? It is magical creating that space in there um, can, can um, have a real impact on stress level. 
Uh, visual cues. So again, to the, the health example, if you are trying to be healthy or remove all, um, so this would be add and remove objects, remove all unhealthy food from the house and create a visual cue of putting a bowl of healthy fruit out there, right? So we're creating this environment. We're creating all these cues of the environment to keep us on task. Um, removing your distractions, put your phone in the other room, changing your social circle. So again, we're back to people. If you want to be a runner, hang out with runners because they talk about running. They talk about good places to run. They talk about the best shoes to wear. They invite you to go running. So that's another huge, really influential part of your physical environment. We do what the people around us are doing. If you want to be a runner, spend time with runners. If you want to be an author, are you part of any author groups? So, right, so we can see how we can change that environment and all those environmental cues will start to change how we respond. Uh, for this group in particular, probably on the computer a lot, change your tech environment. So closing your inbox or putting it on, on inbox pause, get rid of all the rest of the tabs and just work on the project tabs you need to be in. If you're, if you're doing something that doesn't require internet connection, disconnect the internet, turn off your Wi-Fi, something like that. Um, you could be in a shared document or of some kind with somebody. So that's accountability buddy, but tech wise, if you're out of that document, they can tell. Um, and then, you know, go, go done. My, my business is about virtual co-working, which was my drama with procrastination. This was how I solved it. So virtual co-working, it's the same thing as, as why you might go to an exercise class. You're going to do what everyone around you is doing. Really, really helpful. And then some people have some success with creating motivating consequences. So my partner, Jim, is incredibly competitive and we have a push up and sit up challenge that he wins every week, but he, I get to enjoy his big pectoral muscles now because he does so many because he will not lose. So, uh, so for some people that works really well. And then you're tracking, if you have spreadsheet and your streaks and all that, having rewards at milestones, we know the elephant is a short-term thinker, give it a short-term reward. So don't celebrate when you finish the book, celebrate when you finish the first draft of the first chapter. Um, delivery deadlines and asking for feedback, creating those deadlines. Another great tactic is to ask a colleague, not somebody you're super close to that you could just, you know, bail on, but somebody for their feedback on a project and, and set a date for that. Say, when I get to about 50% done on my project, I would love it if you would take a look for me and set that date. And then you're not going to show up to that meeting. Somebody's taking time out of their schedule to be generous to you. A lot of times that will get people moving and get them to, um, to get off of, to get started and to have something for that meeting. So lots of different tactics that you can use. Um, see this as problem solving, as, as a challenge, as a menu of options to use to actually move into getting things done. And as you'll see from a lot of that menu and a lot of things I talked about, involving other people is absolutely a superpower for most of us. It will get us off our, our rear ends and into action. And this came to me through Gretchen Rubin. She has a book called The Four Tendencies. You don't need the book. This link right here, and I'll put a copy. Oh, I grab a copy of it in here, did I? Um, I can, maybe one of you could grab that um, URL and put it in the chat. But if you haven't, it's not science, but it's really, um, uh, she's just a great observer. And this is a really nice mental model to use when you're thinking about, when you're beating yourself up for procrastinating and thinking about what tactics you want to take that are different. Um, this is a really great model. And she looked at how people respond to internal and external expectations. So internal expectations are goals I set for myself. External are goals that my boss sets for me and says, this is due by Friday, something like that. So I, I am an obliger. I'm in that green circle where if somebody else asks for it, uh, like it's there, I'm there hundred percent of the time I'm going to deliver. If I set a goal, it doesn't happen. And I had a really hard time with this for such a long time until I just had to accept that I would love to be an upholder. I think it's terrible. You know, I feel terrible that I want to be able to set my own goals and achieve them. I can do that. I just have to use different tactics. So it's a really fun thing to take a look at. I think that it's really as accurate as some kind of personality things can be, but it just think of it as a really nice model to look at for when you're not getting something done, what tactics are you using? So me, I always involve other people. If you're a questioner, you might need to spend some time thinking about what's in it for me. Why do I want to do this? Right. You ask all the questions on as to why we might want to do this. And if there's any rebels out there, it's a tricky one. I have several rebels in the GoGo Done community who have given me some good tips. So I give my email at the end and you're more than welcome to, to, um, to nudge me for some of those tips because um, it, is, it is a little bit challenging. But once you figure it out, rebels, rebels are a really dynamic bunch. 
So, um, so anyway, when we look at engineering our environment, we want to keep that tendency in mind. When you look at that menu of options, keep your tendency in mind. All right, let's talk about soothing the elephant. So this is again our our old brain, our hind brain, the supercomputer that likes repeated experience. And anytime we try something new, it sends us fear signals of some brand. So most people, when they procrastinate, they have a very specific style of procrastination. And most of us fall in one bucket or the other, sometimes both, or sometimes one bucket for one type of task and another bucket for the other type of task. So we usually fall into avoidant behaviors or obsessive behaviors. So an avoidant behavior would be something in the go-go done community we call noble procrastination. That's when you're being really productive and working really hard, not on the right project. You're doing something else. So you've got something due, you're procrastinating it, but you know, I'm working really hard. I worked all day on all this other stuff, but not the thing I was supposed to do. Similar to that is the 80-20. I'm assuming most folks here know the Pareto, Pareto principle where 20% of the inputs creates 80% of the outputs, right? There's that 20% that's like the guts of it. That's the really important piece to do. So an example of this would be like, I'm going to research book titles and come up with like 10 different book titles for my book instead of writing chapter one, right? That's working on the, the less important parts instead of doing the core, doing the work. So we'll see that happen. So that's another avoidant one. Taking care of other people, uh, time management or prioritization, like you haven't made this task number one, so you fall into some of these other ones. And then the zoning out, the Netflixing and like, and having the, you know, schooner a beer and being like, forget about it. Like, I'm just going to put it out of my head. Those are our avoidant ones. And then um, obsessive ones. This is more rather than not doing the work, but not finishing the work, not shipping the work. So you're going to do one more draft. You got to edit it one more time because there might be a mistake somewhere in there. You're going to add another chapter to that book that's not really necessary in order to ship it or another section to that presentation, whatever it is. Uh, we're going to change directions like 15 different times. Like it just be like, as soon as you get close to shipping, you're like, you know what? Maybe this should be for something else and, and switch the other direction. And they'll have too many people that it's for or too many, um, too many um, outcomes it's trying to serve, too many who it's for and what it's for. So we'll, we just mushrooms, we call these projects mushrooms because they just get bigger and bigger and bigger and you never ship them. You never learn from them. You never get feedback on them. Nothing ever happens because you, you got to do one more thing. So let's pop back into Mentimeter and go to our next question um, from that list or from your own experience, not a comprehensive list. Um, when you think about this task that you, you talked about at the very beginning, What's your big, most typical procrastination behavior or behaviors? You can put more than one in. So what, what is everyone out there experiencing when they go for that big project? Got avoidant. I'm in the avoidant camp. I don't obsess often. Find another important task, noble procrastinator. It's a person after my own heart. Uh, yep, avoid checking the phone, communications and mail, definitely. I can spend eight hours in email I, easily, easily. Scrolling social media, oh, social media. They, I mean, they do research to figure out how to hit those dopamine receptors in the brain. It's, it is real. It is legit addictive. Um, checking whether I can help anyone else first. Yes. And that's a, that's an obliger out there after my own heart. I'm sure. Um, convince myself it's not urgent and it can be done later. Definitely. That's a good one. That's another good avoidant one. I'll have to add that to my list. Um, do all the smaller tasks first. Yes. Cleaning up. I do. I will say I do love a little bit of no noble procrastination when it gets me to clean my house. Uh, creating a to-do list for the remaining tasks. If you don't stop at the to-do list, sometimes that's incredibly helpful. But if you just do the to-do list instead of the work, not so good, not so good. Uh, yeah, looks good, looks good. Starting the next project, oh, that's such a good one. I'm totally, a, I love the beginning of the project, the ideation, the idea, oh, love that. Excellent, excellent, excellent. All right, y'all. Uh, so I'm going to put you into, let me hold on. I'm going to zoom you into breakout rooms. Here we go. Um, and I wanted you to take the same question. I'm going to put it in the chat. 
we want you to share out loud with your colleagues both the project that you shared to the degree you're willing to share and your particular type of procrastination. I'm gonna give you about four minutes to do that. I'm gonna create the breakout rooms and open them. I'll bring you back in about four or five minutes. All right, welcome back, welcome back. If you had any major epiphanies, pop them into the chat. I'd love to hear if anything came up for you all. But uh, in the interest of time, we will go ahead and, and move along. So let's dive a little bit deeper into, um, into working and with soothing this elephant. So you've identified the behaviors that are most common for you, uh, which is great because sometimes we procrastinate without really kind of seeing it and naming it. And so now we know when we see these behaviors, they're coming from those unpleasant emotions from uh, the elephant. And we know that we're procrastinating and we know that there's work to do either on the path or again, soothing the elephant. So we want to... Um, we want to translate our behaviors into emotions because that's the elephant's language. So these are our questions. When I picture myself starting to do the work, I feel and really start to, to step into that emotion rather than avoiding it, right? We like to avoid unpleasant emotions, hence distraction or avoidance, right? Step into those emotions and see what it is that you, you're feeling, what kinds of, what, what form this negative feeling takes. And then do a little free write or a brain write, or if you're a talker, talk to somebody and say, I don't want to do this work because, or talk to yourself around the house and just be, just get it out, get, shine a light on what it is to try to, to solve this puzzle. Um, and for the people who have trouble shipping the work, they're doing the work, they're not finishing it. Um, when I picture myself actually hitting send or publish or whatever the button is, that final one, um, what are those specific emotions? And then why are you not, what is it that's coming up when you say, I'm not ready because, and make that list. So answering all this and putting those emotions into the words puts it into that elephant's language. And it's going to be the core of your strategy to, to embrace that elephant. So, um, so we know that those avoidant and obsessive behaviors are the signals. The elephant is grumpy. Um, and so that first step is always noticing. Um, and then your elephant is really just asking to be soothed. And how we soothe it depends on what exactly it's worried about. So I'm going to cover three top emotions that come out. When we, when we ask ourselves that question of, um, of, you know, what do we feel when we're sitting down to do the work? Um, and there are more than that, it'll be more nuanced, but this is gonna give you a nice framework to move forward. So procrastination, probably the number one all time, right? The elephant is afraid of, it doesn't wanna die or be excommunicated from the tribe, the whole thing. Fear is usually at the core of a lot of things. So. We, fear is a, a what if the worst case scenario happens, right? So here are some of our worst case scenarios. What if people laugh at me? I get laughed at. It's not accepted. Um, a little imposter syndrome. Who am I to think that what I have to offer is worthwhile? <clears throat> we don't want to be kicked out of our tribe. So what if it becomes clear I don't belong? Like, I'm not going to ship that podcast because the, the podcasters might laugh at me and then I can't be a podcaster anymore, right? We get kicked out. Um, or what if they never ask me back, right? This is kind of that shame, excommunication kind of code together. And then of course, death. The elephant is not logical all the time. It's like, I'll lose all my money, end up on the street, like, and then I will die and it will be terrible. So the elephant will get very illogical, but it will feel that and it will push it into your, your, into the emotion system. And we'll, and we'll feel those actual emotions and be really People will be really terrified about doing these things. And it's a real thing happening in the brain. It's not, you're not crazy. It's nothing like that. It's just that part of the system operating. And so one of the best um, ways to deal with this, I really like Tim Ferriss's TED talk from many years ago. There's my chat um, about <clears throat> uh, fear setting. And he gives his slides away for free. And here are his slides. Um, you go and you define what you're scared of. What are the fears? What if I fail miserably? You know, what if, what if everybody laughs at me? What if they kick me out? All of that. And then you look at what you might do to prevent that from happening and what the consequences, if it did happen, what you might do, right? And so take that phantom, scary craziness, right? And, and put it down on paper and in words. So one thing I do think is missing from this is the likelihood of this happening. So that I might lose all my money and end up on the street. It's like, well, you know, my dad will probably put me up, so I'll probably be okay. Right. That was the likelihood is low likelihood, because sometimes we can take some of those fears and just wipe them right off the table once we um, really face how unlikely they are to happen. So I would add that into the mix. Um, he then asks, what might be the benefits of an attempt or partial success? So we think all are in kind of all or nothing kind of thing. 
Uh, but sometimes when our first attempt, this is a group that understands iteration, right? Ship, learn, iterate, right? So you can't iterate unless you ship it. You can't learn from something unless you try and fail or partially succeed or learn from the attempt, right? So let's, let's look at the bright side of what we get out of shipping our work and doing, sitting down to do something. And then the, the classic, um, the cost of inaction, the what, what are we losing by not acting? And he does the six months, the one year, the three years. So this is a bit of a, a big process. So this is a great thing to do if you're really stuck on a big project. But one of the magic things about the elephant is that it learns with repetition. Once you, and it's an energy miser, it doesn't want to spend energy. Once it knows we're going to be going through this process a few times, it'll start committing it to memory and you'll go through it faster and you might not even need to write it down. You'll find yourself going through the process where you feel the procrastination push, right? You feel those negative emotions when you think about sitting down to do the work and you're like, I know what this is. It's the elephant. It's afraid. What's it afraid of? What am I really afraid of? Right. And you just kind of mentally go through it. So that's, you don't want to every single tiny task do this whole process or you could, but don't do that forever. Do it for a week or something like that and, and start to get this process kind of rote and be able to do it in your head in, in a much faster way. And you can say the written part for doing it um, for really big, sticky, sticky projects. So let's pop over to Mentimeter again and go to our next um, input slide. So when you think about the task you've been procrastinating, really dig into that elephant. Like what is the absolute worst thing that could happen? And really get dark with this one. Let's dig into that elephant because that elephant goes off its rocker, really. It gets a little bit nuts and it sends us these really intense emotions. What is the absolute worst thing that could happen? And let's shine a light on it and see. You could be fired, yes. Sometimes that is a, a, a real fear. So always one to be checked with when other people are, are, are involved. Um, but yes, but usually unlikely to happen. Uh, people want me to do more and more. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you got to learn those saying no skills and building boundaries. It's true. Oh, people coming up with really scary things. So that way we're not seeing more pop up. Uh, yes, lose face, lose reputation. That's a, that's a big one. That's a big one. That goes with that belonging in that tribe. Uh, you'll have too much time on your hands. Is that really a worry? I want your life. But that really, you know, if, it's, if it creates fear for you, that's legitimate. Um, is it laziness? Uh, if not much, is it laziness, not procrastination? That's, that's actually a good question. Um, it's probably, it, first of all, I've never, not laziness. It's 100% not laziness. There's not a fear around it. It's probably something else. So if not much happens, if you're not really afraid of it, well, hopefully I'll hit it with one of the other two emotions that we're covering, but tap into those emotions. It's not laziness, but if you're not naturally kind of going into it, it could be that it's the wrong task that you're not really wanting to do it. It could be something like that. It could be too big of a task. We'll talk about overwhelm, something like that. So not laziness. This is a mystery to solve. Get investigative, get, you know, get your magnifying glass out and your Sherlock Holmes hat and go explore. Um, I'd be, need to be very assertive to support my standpoint. Ooh, that's a big one. That's a big one. That's a whole other skill set that you need to stand by the work itself. Nobody notices. That's the heartbreak. That's the heartbreak. Uh, let's see if it'll scroll for me. Scroll for me slide. Somebody's going to get crushed by something, but this, this, my little slide's not scrolling. So we can see the heaviness of the emotions here. And this is why I'm telling the person who thinks they might be lazy, like it's just never laziness. People aren't, we aren't lazy by nature. We might be energy efficient by nature, right? We don't want to do something. But as soon as we can get to the point where there's, um, where there's an incentive for it, right? We will kick into action if we remove these other barriers or smooth that path, right? <clears throat> so getting crushed by criticism. Yes, absolutely, right? So these are real visceral, like in the body, like intense emotions. It is, it is a big deal. And it's not like, it's not something to just shrug your shoulders and say, try harder. This is not a try harder thing. The fe feelings are real and they are hard, can be really hard to overcome. So sometimes fear setting will be enough to just go through that process. Um, sometimes it won't be enough, but it's always a great place to start. Um, but again, once you do it a few times, it starts to become a habit. It starts to become a skill that you have. So 
Procrastination emotion number two, indecision. So this is uh, for anybody who has 3000 emails in their inbox. This is probably something that you're really familiar with is, is, is making that next decision. So indecision, usually about not having enough data to predict the outcome. Uh, our elephant wants to know what's going to happen. And if we don't have enough data, it's like, mm, no, no. Right. Or fear of regret if I make the wrong decision. You know, can you walk it back? So we can never know all the variables involved in a decision. Uh, the as much as the elephant wants to and wants to have its predictive model, you can never know. So making a decision, um, if you have procrastination around it, it's because you don't have all of those variables. So we're going to need to take a risk. And so we're going to need to smooth the path, soothe the elephant. If you notice that elephant, you can see how the elephant wants us to do the same thing all the time. If you notice, if you go to a course, the multi-day, whatever chair you sit in, you tend to sit in the same chair every time. When you enter an elevator, you tend to go to the same spot every time. When we drive somewhere, we tend to take the same route, even if it's about the same, right? So we'll see this, this um, push to do the same thing we've always done. So when it comes to indecision, you're going to need to do something different than you've always done. Um, so some tools for tackling. So we have small decisions and big decisions. We're going to go over the both of them. Um, <clears throat> so for tools for tackling like a small decision. Acknowledge there's a decision to be made that you're avoiding. So um, I had an email in my inbox that was um, directions to an event we're doing at the end of the month. And it was just sitting in my inbox and I wasn't doing anything with it. And then I finally was like, you're not going to hit inbox zero unless you make a decision around this. Um, so what information are you missing? If you knew it, it would be an easy decision. So for me, it was if we knew all the registrants, I wanted all the registrants in there. I didn't want to have to send it multiple times. So um, and so then, uh, then we go into our opportunity cost, listing the consequences of each option and of those of not deciding. And I was like, I'm not going to hit inbox zero if I don't send this. So what I needed to do was put into my to-do list to post the event in these other places to get it filled up. And then I snoozed the email until my deadline. And even if it wasn't full, we were moving forward, right? So I had to make that decision. But until I actually stopped and looked at it and kind of went through this process, it just wasn't going to happen. Um, so real little small thing, but inbox zero is a collection of little small things. So um, if it's um, sometimes if there's some, uh, there wasn't a lot of heavy weight around this one, it was a miscellaneous task, but sometimes if it's a, um, a more intense decision, acknowledging that a good decision can lead to a bad outcome because we can't know all the variables and because life is crazy, sometimes uh, we make the best decision that could be made if you poker players get this one, right? They bet based on what the odds are. It's the best decision they could possibly make. And sometimes they still lose. Um, and then what can you put in place to test or walk back the decision? Right. So our second, I believe our second to last question here. Uh, what is one negative consequence for not doing your procrastinated task? So again, we saw this in the fear setting. Um, opportunity cost is talked a lot about. So what are you missing out on by not doing the work? Ah, yes. Getting criticized for running late on the task. We definitely have uh, a lot of a lot of that um, internally, sometimes externally. So it sounds like you're getting it externally. I do a lot of self criticism around around that. Yes, you're not learning. You're not learning. If you ship something and it does incredibly well, we get to celebrate. But there's always something to be learned when we finally put it out in the world. It's going to keep bugging me. It is a huge stressor. It is a huge stressor. I have, a, I do still procrastinate a few things and it still floors me every time when I finally do it. Number one, it wasn't as hard as I thought. And number two, I feel so good afterwards. Yes. Lost opportunity for sure. For sure. All right. I think people's hands are busy and I want to be careful about the time. So I'm going to pop back into the slides. Okay. Now, when it comes to tackling big, scary, hairy decisions, um, I think the best, absolute best way to do it is to mastermind it, is to get other people involved. There are a lot of ways to mastermind things, but getting other people involved in the decision, not that they get to make the decision or that they should make the decision, but it's, uh, it's taking your brain and magnifying it. So this is why we work in groups, right? To take advantage of multiple perspectives. Um, so it'll add new information by bringing everybody else's perspectives in. Um, it also creates buy-in to generate, uh, it could buy into your entire situation. People are like in it. Once they've given you advice, they want to know how it turned out, right? So this adds fuel to our fire. 
And, um, and then they generate support, which the elephant likes, right? We're belonging in our group and, and feeling comfortable. Um, we get reassurance from the community, right? And that's going to uh, ease the fear up a little bit. And it also distributes blame, even if it's in your own head. It's not to say that we want to go and blame our mastermind group when we make the wrong decision. But if we're talking to the elephant who is not totally rational, right? It's like everybody said that we should do it this way. It's not that I'm, you know, horrible and should, you know, not be doing this kind of work. Um, so, and research the elephant, you're not alone. You're not going to get kicked out of the tribe. If everybody thought it was a good idea and it didn't pan out well, nobody's going to be kicking you out. So, um, so I highly recommend having a mastermind group of some kind. I have it woven into my premium community where we're doing that regularly because it's just, it really helps you get unstuck. And then of course, because you're getting all these other perspectives, the work tends to be better. Whatever, whatever ends up happening tends to be quite a bit better. Okay. Our last one uh, is overwhelm. So this, we experience overwhelm when the task is too big. Somebody mentioned this in one of the earlier quiz uh, questions. Uh, or the task is too vague or a lot hinges on the outcome. If you're feeling overwhelmed because a lot hinges on the outcome, probably pop back to the fear setting exercise and do a little bit of that. But if you feel like you have a big task uh, and you can't tell me what the first and most important step is, there's a little bit of work to be done here. So we call it the art of the start. I, one of the things I offer in my community is um, a two-week sprint. And so we take that project we're procrastinating on and it gives us time blocks for it and all these other things. But we have this focus time to do it. But I take folks through, um, they usually bring something big and I take folks through a process, a goal-setting process of really breaking it down and getting specific and, and planning all the detailed tasks. And so this is the process that we go through. We list all of the project tasks, just list them all. Um, organize them in an Eisenhower matrix. So an Eisenhower matrix is where you rank it by importance and urgency. It's got the four boxes in there. So if it's important and urgent, it goes over here. If it's important and not urgent and so on. So you, you take those tasks and sort them. Um, and then you take all the ones in the important boxes and um, list them out and give them time estimates. If the time estimate that you've given a task is greater than four hours, break it down. Humans are terrible at estimating time. We just, it, there's research behind it. Like we're bad at doing time estimates. So if it's more than four hours, unless we get it small enough. So if it's more than four hours, if you think, oh, I'll create a landing page. It'll take about four hours. It's like, eh, no, it's, break that down. You're going to write the copy. How long is it going to take you to write the copy for the landing page? Then you're going to source the graphics. And how, is, how long is that going to take? Something like along those lines. This is the one I get the most pushback from, but it's actually where the magic lives. Take those time estimates and multiply them by three. This is why you do it. Because number one, we tend to, um, to imagine our future selves as having superpowers and not having a bad day and everything goes smoothly, right? We think our future selves are going to be rock stars. We never are. We have a day just like we did today where, you know, you got to pick up your kid from school because they're throwing up and then dinner burns and the whole thing, right? Like normal life is going to happen. The other thing you'd look at is um, think about the emotional state that you're in when you are ahead of schedule and have extra time. If I budget three hours for something and I'm done at two hours, I could take that extra hour and make the task better. I could fancy it up, add some elements to it, double check my work. Like I have all this time to make, to, to produce something not only that is passable, but that could be great, right? Or maybe I pull and I get ahead of schedule and pull the next task and start it early. Or maybe I take a nap. Like maybe I give myself some time to rest. But think about emotional state that you're in, how you treat the people around you, how you feel, where your blood pressure is and your heart rate, right? This is going to be totally different than when we operate where most of us operate, which is 20 tasks behind schedule, not enough time to do anything, sure didn't take a nap, not doing my meditation anymore. And I come home and I yell at my partner for not cleaning the house. Like that's the place where most of us are living in. If you multiply what you have to do by three, you will create enough time to do that task and do it well and allow time for things to not go as expected or for new information to come in or for your computer to crash and you lost half of it. Like all of those things, um, you have that space for it and it creates a different emotional state for you. And frankly, one that you're more efficient when you're in it anyway. So you tend to do better work and do it faster. So everybody balks on this. But, you know, our productivity sessions in GoGo Done are three 25-minute Pomodoros. And I cannot tell you how many times people come in and they say what they're going to work on in the first Pomodoro and they finish it by the last one, not the end of the first one, but the end of the last one times three. So nobody will probably do this. It, it really, it stakes to do it because you're like, oh my gosh, this stakes forever. 
But guess what? Stuff takes forever. And until you embrace reality, you're going to be stuck in busy land with your to-do list not done and feeling anxious. So multiply times three, at least try it, at least experiment with it. Um, and then we 80, 20, our list, we find the 20% that's the most important that will, that we need in order to deliver it. And from the tasks in our uh, 20 list, time block them on the coming week. If you're a rebel, the Gretchen Rubin for tendencies, just make a list for the week and time block sometimes to work on them and then reassess weekly. I don't like to, and this group will, you know, we'll, we'll get it. Like you kind of want to have a lot of assessment points because you'll change a little bit as you learn and do some of the work. So, um, a pro tip for you all that I think is really important. This came from my mental health days. Uh, we think that we get motivated and do something and that rarely happens. What usually happens is about 60 to 90 seconds in, in action on something, then the motivation centers of the brain light up. So this is where the, the, um, what does it say? BJ fog and the tiny habits, right? Start with just the two minute chunks. So if you really are, are stuck on something, set that two minute goal and then those allow those motivation centers in the brain to, to kick on. So I know people aren't um, terribly available for the Mentimeter questions. So I'm going to go ahead and skip that. And we're at just past the top of the hour. So we'll go straight into the summary. So um, what I want for you all to take away from this is the influence of the writer's willpower is limited. You're not weak. You're not lazy. It's nothing wrong with you. You need to pick some different tactics. Uh, procrastination is not a personal flaw. It's a notification system. It's a message from that inner elephant that wants to keep you alive, that loves you, that wants you to survive. Uh, it's worried about that survival. And so this is the opportunity to soothe the elephant so that we can work on thriving. Um, and engineering your environment for success is the most powerful tool to get things done, especially when it involves other people. Um, and understanding and learning how to work with your elephant will change your relationship with procrastination long term. So remember that the elephant lives by repeated experience. So your brain could say, oh, procrastination, it's not a horrible thing. It's just notification system, but you still feel like crap when you think about doing something. And then your, your old mental models of you're lazy start to, you know, right? That's not going to change overnight. But what you want to do is continue to repeat a more positive mantra, which is this is notification uh, part of me wants to stay safe, which is wonderful. I would like to thrive. We're going to take a risk and here's how we're going to do it. And then engineer your environment, right? That's where we want to be. So, um, that's it. I do have, if you want a freebie, I will put a link in the chat. You can have copies of the slides and, um, a copy of the worksheet that I use in the sprint for doing the goal setting. So that was the one where you list all your tasks and you put them in the Eisenhower matrix and 80, 20 of them more than welcome. It'll say go, go sprint at the top. It's just what I use with that group. Uh, but you're more than welcome to play around with those. That's where the multiply by three lives. So just know that if you opt into it, I'm going to nudge you in that direction because it is really helpful and really has a huge impact on how um, folks feel um, day, on a day-to-day -day basis. So that does it for me. I'm happy to answer any questions, either coming off mute or popping it in the chat. And I'm also happy to let you go have dinner too. I, I do have a question, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, what, what, what's really, what sounded very different from your presentation from, from the others that I have seen is that you have focused on uh, basically well-being of a person rather than a team or an organization or the, you know, the effic efficiency of it. Is that something that you find missing in general or it's just me that... I know that I, I miss this aspect being addressed. Yes, I find for the most part that procrastination is, um, is really about that internal state and about that mood. So it can, um, it can come out to, uh, to express itself team-wide, uh, especially if somebody's work is dependent on somebody else completing their work. Um, so in terms so in terms of a health of a team, you might find somebody who really struggles ineffectively with procrastination, gets kicked off the team, gets reprimanded, right? There were some fears in there around getting fired, that kind of thing. Like it's a real thing. But um, procrastination in a, in a team usually boils down to, um, to if, if the work is clear and what needs to be done. So we could go back to that overwhelm section where it's too big or too vague, right? That could be one of the problems. And that could be um, something you could look at as a team leader. 
Um, it does, you know, the person who's not producing, do they know what they're supposed to do? Do they need some help figuring out how to break that down? That's just a skill set, right? The whole worksheet um, of how to goal set and, and time estimate, those are skills. There's a reason there's a worksheet for it because we don't do it naturally. We really need to break, break things down and do it. But I think when it comes to a team, this is a, this is a piece where it, you could find patterns. And so if there's a pattern of procrastination, I would check overwhelm, check that vagueness issue. Because as a leader of that team or as a, a member of the team, if you don't know what you're supposed to be doing and somebody says you're late with this and you don't know how to start, right? Then that, that response is clear. You go to the leader or whoever and get that breakdown. But really, I find that, that a lot of it is just that in that emotional place and those patterns that we've developed as individuals, and then they kind of get expressed in a team, but a team will come together. If you think about the Gretchen Rubin stuff, you could have a team full of upholders and never have a problem, right? Or you could have a team full of rebels and everybody's like, you know, nobody's delivering anything at any point. So I would use the overwhelm piece and I'd use that Gretchen Rubin model to see you know, what's happening in a team and are you asking a rebel to do the work of an upholder, right? To, 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 to do the work in the way that the upholder does it, right? The tactics. So I would look at the tactics for the team, but you're going to have a huge diversity in the teams that come together and what tactics will work with each individual. So you could play around and, and play with teams and put together a team of obligers or put together a team, you know, some of these other teams and, and play with that and see if you want to use the same tactics for everyone. But I, I really think the individuals having ownership about how they go about doing the work is really important and it needs to suit their natural way of working. So you might have too much rigidity in a team and expecting people to operate outside their, their natural way of being be another, another challenge. If and feel free it, yeah. to email me too, if it's something you want, don't want to share. Sometimes the, the work gets a little bit personal and I'm happy to, to keep it private as well.